lesson B2, multiculturalism. So last time we talked about culture generally and how it allows us to adapt to many different environments and to change much faster than our actual biology and DNA can change. So what is culture? It's all of the ways of acting and even the ways of thinking, behavior and thought, and even material objects that together form our way of life or any people's way of life. So here we have um, someone's depiction of what a stereotypical American looks like. Um, and I'm assuming this is someone who is not from American culture themselves. But you can see some of the material aspects of our culture, jeans, cowboy hats, t-shirts, hamburgers, and some non-material aspects. The friendly smile, the overeating lifestyle perhaps, the patriotism, the informality. So if biology is shaped by our genetics, which is made up of DNA, society is shaped by culture. So what makes up culture? Well, there's material culture, like I said, things like your clothes, your tools, your food, your buildings. There's non-material culture too. Uh, things like norms, the way we tend to do things, what we see as normal. Symbols, even the words that I'm saying, sounds and images that we have a shared meaning for, that means something to us as a people. And together they form language, which we talked about last time, the importance of that. And then lastly, values. What we see as important, what we see as desirable, beautiful, what we see as right and good. But we have to be very careful because Americans, like most people, tend to see the world through the lens of their own eye. We have a biased view of the world based on the culture we've grown up in. And um, this, again, I think is made by someone who does not actually come from the U.S., but we often do tend to see ourselves as being a bigger, more important, and more central part of the world than uh, is perhaps fair. Um, and it can shape our view of other places, and it can make us kind of simplify and minimalize other places, group whole continents into one, um, one idea, one stereotype, whole regions. Um, so we have to get beyond that. This is going to be, this lecture is all about learning to l use Versteheim to see from other people's cultural perspectives. So material culture, here we have costumes from around the world, different cultures, clothing, many different ways to do things. If you're from a traditional Japanese family, maybe you eat with chopsticks and you eat sushi. If you're from an Italian family, maybe you eat spaghetti and use a fork. I don't know where this is from, but maybe you use a skewer and put your food on it. Many different hats from around the world, an American hat, an Indian hat, a German hat, a Tibetan hat, a Madarin house, an Indonesian house, and a New Orleans house. And again, you can see in Indonesia and New Orleans, both are adapted to the particular climate that they're in, where there's a high chance of flooding. And you'll see other New Orleans homes that are raised up even higher for that purpose. But it's not just that. It's also the coloring. New Orleans is a particular culture within the United States, has some aspects of its culture that are a bit different. For instance, bright colors are very, very common and popular. Yet we live in a global world, and cultures touch each other, they overlap, and they diffuse into one another. Cultural diffusion is just cultural traits moving outward into a culture. And so in a in a globalized world, we start seeing some things appearing in many different places that aren't the place where they originated. So you can go to almost any country and go to a McDonald's. You can buy jeans and you'll see people wearing jeans in most countries in the world. You'll see some similar shapes of apartment buildings and phones, which you may not think of as a cultural item, but those are something that we have created as a people. It is a tool that we pass on, and they are so useful, in fact, to us that you can go almost anywhere in the world and buy a phone. Something becomes a part of culture when we make use of it as a people, when we, in some consistent way, shape it, change it, use it as a tool, give it some certain symbolism. For instance, diamonds in the earth, essentially worthless but diamonds put into a ring and sold to people who believe that diamonds are valuable and that are a symbol of, of wealth and even of marriage, um, people will pay a lot of money for.
an important part of our culture. But it's more than just those materials. Non-material culture includes norms of behavior. What do you consider normal? There are many ways of greeting one another in the world. In some cultures, it's bowing. In some cultures, it's shaking hands. In some cultures, it's a kiss on the cheek. Now, these norms of behavior can be informal or formal. Informal norms are things that we commonly do. They're, they're folk ways. They're casual. They're, you know, the th kind of things that maybe your parents taught you at the dinner table, like don't put your elbows on the table. Formal norms are usually much more serious. They're written in stone, uh, literally, <laughs> sometimes. Not so literally in others, but things like killing. Almost every culture in the world has certain rules around one person killing another person, when it's acceptable, when it's unacceptable. Um, and when those formal norms, they're, they're not necessarily written in law, but they tend to be written or um, given in a very distinct, repetitive, always the same way. Um, and they're taken very serious. They're mores. And breaking them often comes with very serious sanctions, like prison. Whereas breaking an informal norm, while people may think it's a bit odd, are generally not going to come with very severe sanctions. Now, the very word norm implies normal. And we tend to see what our culture does as normal. And what other people do, we often see as weird or wrong. And that's ethnocentrism again in action. Ethnocentrism simply means centering or focusing on your own culture. Um, and that often leads to culture shock. We see something that seems to us very weird or even wrong. And it can take us aback and maybe make us react with anger or disgust. Do you see here ethnocentrism going two ways? A woman in a bikini... Um, seeing a woman in a burqa and saying everything covered but her eyes, what a cruel male-dominated culture. And a woman in a burqa seeing a woman wearing nothing but a bikini, saying nothing covered but her eyes, what a cruel male-dominated culture. Both seeing the other through their own cultural lens. So multiculturalism is the attempt to recognize that cultural diversity and uh, promote equality amidst these cultures. So an ethnocentric viewpoint, again, it's judging another culture by your own culture. So that's different from me, therefore that is wrong. Centering on your own culture. And what we're trying to do, I think, more and more as a society, is use a perspective of cultural relativism, judging unfamiliar cultural traits by the standards of that culture. So you might ask, well, that's different to me, but is it normal for them? Say someone puts out, hands you a plate of fried cockroaches. Now you're in, if you're not used to eating fried cockroaches, your initial response may be culture shock. You may think, oh my god, I, they're asking me to eat that? An ethno ethnocentric response would be, what's wrong with you? How could you try and serve me that? That's not food. A relativistic response would be to say, well, that's, that's different. That's interesting. I'm, I'm not used to that. Um, do you do you like fried cockroaches? Intra you you eat them a lot. Oh, okay. Well, um, maybe I'll uh, m maybe I'll give them a try. Or maybe they're not for me, but um, I could see how you would enjoy them. 